husband's going to come to my house and hang out on Tuesday nights. Yeah. Dave. Hang out with Dave. Yes. I love that. Yeah. Um, anyway, so I'm just excited to be here. We have two daughters. Marin is seven. That makes me feel very old to say I have a seven-year-old. And Savannah is five. And we're in the process of adopting um, from South Africa. Um, so that could be number three and four, or just number three. I'm pulling for two. Dave's pulling for one. So um, <laughs> moving on with that. I'm a grown-up church girl, um, and my husband is not. When we first, we've been at Colonial for six years. Our very first Sunday visiting here, we went to a church in Midtown for the first six years of our marriage, and then we moved out to the Burbs. Um, and thought we should probably be like normal verb people and join like a suburban church. So we did. And we came to Colonial and it was Youth Sunday. And Corey was speaking that Sunday. And he said that one of the missions of student ministries at Colonial was that every student would go to college with a faith of their own. And that struck a great chord in me because I'm a grown up church girl who went to college without a faith of my own. And Dave is a womb to tomb believer. Um, <laughs> Christmas, Easter, yeah, womb to tomb, get it? Yeah, you never heard that? Okay, so his family was womb to tomb people. They went to church on Christmas, and they went to church on Easter, and that's it. And then his senior year of college is when he just gave his life over to the Lord, and um, and we got to meet after that, and it was love at first sight. No, it really wasn't. Um, but anyway, uh, but when we came here, that we were passionate about that, because that is what we want for our family and for our children is we want them to have a faith that is their own and not my faith, not my husband's faith, not the faith of other people around them, but they are sold out for Jesus and he reigns over their hearts and their lives and we were excited about that. So here we are, we ended up here at Colonial. So I have the beauty of bringing the creation story to you um, and if you are a person that is so excited about hearing um, the scientific research behind creation and versus evolution and all of that, I just want to let you know you're in the wrong talk. <laughs> I will not be speaking about any of those facts. There's tons of facts out there, and there's people who are wise enough and um, studied enough to speak those things to you, and I am not one of those. Um, there's lots of that. If, if you guys heard Matt Chandler at Passion, if you were at Passion, yes? Yes. Yes? Okay. Yeah. I watched it online, so you guys can watch all the same Passion talks that they all watched online and of the years past. I'd encourage you to do that. And he gave some of those pretty strong facts of, that really prove that creation is true from a scientific standpoint from people who don't even believe in God, which is just so amazing to me. So I'm going to, I borrowed Savannah's Bible today, and if you would just humor me for just a little bit, I'm going to read from the Jesus Storybook Bible, Woo! creation story, okay? And don't worry, I'll get to the this person Bible later, so y'all, we'll, we'll step it up a notch in a minute. Okay. The heavens are singing about how great God is, and the skies are shouting it out. See what God has made day after day, night after night. They are speaking to us. Psalm 19, 1-2. God wrote, I love you. He wrote it in the sky and on the earth and under the sea. He wrote his message everywhere because God created everything in his world to reflect him like a mirror. To show us what he is like, to help us know him, and to make our hearts sing. The way a kitten chases her tail, the way red poppies grow wild, the way a dolphin swims, and God put it into words, too. And he wrote it in a book, and it's called the Bible. Now, some people think the Bible is a book of rules telling you what you should and shouldn't do. The Bible certainly does have rules in it. They show you how life works best. But the Bible isn't mainly about you and what you should be doing. It's about God and about what he has done. Other people think the Bible is a book of heroes, showing you people you should copy. The Bible does have some heroes in it, and as you'll soon find out, as you study it more, most of the people in the Bible aren't really heroes at all, and they make some very big mistakes, and sometimes on purpose. They get afraid, and they run away, and at times, they're downright mean. No, the Bible isn't a book of rules or a book of heroes. The Bible is most of all a story. It's an adventure story about a young hero who comes from a far country to win back his lost treasure. It's a love story about a brave prince who leaves his palace, his throne, everything to rescue the ones that he loves. It's like the most wonderful fairy tale, except it's true. You see, the best thing about this story is that it is true. There are lots of stories in the Bible, but all the stories are telling just one big story. The story of how God loves his children and comes to rescue them. It takes the whole Bible to tell this story, and at the center of the story, there's a baby. Every story in the Bible whispers his name. He is like the missing piece in a puzzle, the piece that makes all the other pieces fit together, and suddenly you can see a beautiful picture. And this is no ordinary baby. This is the child upon whom everything would depend. This is the 
child who would one day... Wait, our story starts where all good stories start, at the very beginning. In the beginning, there was nothing. Nothing to hear, nothing to feel, nothing to see, only emptiness and darkness and nothing but nothing. But God was there, and God had a wonderful plan. I'll take this emptiness, God said, and I'll fill it up. Out of the darkness, I'm going to make light, and out of the nothing, I'm going to make everything. Like a mommy bird flutters over her wings, over her eggs to help her babies hatch, God hovered over the deep, silent darkness, and he was making life happen. God spoke, that's all. And whatever he said, happened. God said, hello, light, and the light shone into the darkness. God called the light day and the darkness night. You're good, God said, and they were. Then God said, hello, sea, hello, sky, and a great space opened up wide and deep and high. You're good, God said, and they were. Then God said, hello, land, and there, splashing up through the oceans, came cliffs and mountains and sandy beaches. You're good, God said, and they were. Hello, trees, God said. Hello, grass and flowers and everything everywhere burst into life. He made buds, buds, and shoot, shoot, flowers, flower. You're good, God said. And they were. Hello, stars, God said. Hello, sun, hello, moon. And whizzing into the darkness came fiery globes, spinning around and around, whirling orange and purple and golden planets. You're good, God said. And they were. Hello, birds, God said, and with a fluttering and a flapping and a chirping and a singing, birds filled the skies. Hello, fish, God said, and with a darting and a dashing and a wriggling and a splashing, fish filled the seas. You're good, God said, and they were. Then God said, hello, animals, and everyone came out to play. The whole earth was filled with noisy noises, growling and gobbling and snapping and snorting. You're good, God said, and they were. God saw all that he had made, and he loved them, and they were lovely because he loved them. But God saved the best for last. From the beginning, God had a shining dream in his heart. He would make people to share his forever happiness. They would be his children, and the world would be their perfect home. So God breathed life into Adam and Eve. And when they opened their eyes, the first thing they ever saw was God's face. And when God saw them, he was like a new daddy. You look like me, he said. You're the most beautiful thing I have ever made. God loved them with all of his heart, and they were lovely because he loved them. And Adam and Eve joined in the song of the stars and the streams and the wind and the trees, the wonderful song of love to the one who made them. Their hearts were filled with happiness, and nothing ever made them sad, lonely, afraid. God looked at everything he had made. Perfect, he said, and it was. But all the stars and the mountains and oceans and galaxies and everything were nothing compared to how much God loved his children. He would move heaven and earth to be near them, always. Whatever happened, whatever it cost them, he would always love them. And so it was that, that the wonderful love story began. One of my favorite devotionals, it's called If Equip, if any of you guys have heard of it, um, it gives you a passage of scripture to read, and then it has you answer three statements or three questions for yourself. It says, if this passage of scripture is true, if it's completely true, then what does that mean about God? What does that mean about you? And what does that mean about the world? So we're going to do that today. I want you, if you would humor me, close your eyes. Now I want you to picture God in your mind. Just picture him. What does he look like? Where is he at? What colors do you see? Just give a good picture of it. Okay, you can open your eyes. Whatever you pictured is way too small. I set you up for a trick question. Sorry about that. <laughs> Our imagination is not big enough. We are not creative enough to even envision at all what God could look like. You know, the best artists in the world are still dependent on materials that already exist. The best builders, the best architects, you can't make something out of nothing. You and I cannot create. It might be great. It might look awesome. We look at statues, all of those things, and they're awesome. But they didn't come from materials that were not already made. But not our God. The God of beginnings. Okay, so I want to know how big God is in your life. You see, it says, if we turn to the big, big girl Bible, big girl Bible, <laughs> big person Bible, it says this, it said, God said, God saw, God called, God made, God set, God created, God blessed, God looked, God declared. 
He's at the center of the entire creation story. At the center of it all, and he made no mistakes, nothing was lacking, and he was actively involved in all of that. And I just want to take a moment, and I just want to say to you, because there might be somebody in here that needs to hear this, you were made with no mistakes. You are lacking nothing. God is meant to live at the center of your life. And he wants to be actively involved in your life. I want you to ask yourself, where do you need God to call something or to set something, to make something, to create something, to bless something, or to declare something in your life? Because that's the God of creation. That's what he does. That's what we read here. Now, Genesis 1.1, talk about a heavy verse. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Whoa. I mean, if this is true, if that's really true, you guys. Like, seriously true. This isn't Sunday school. I've got no felt board behind me. Like, we're not going to do any of that felt board stuff. If this is true, it demands a response from all of us. There's no middle. There's no, well, you know, yeah, yeah, I think he made, he made stuff, and, but I don't know if he made all of it, you know, I'm not sure about it. There's no, no, none of that. It's either he did or he did it, right? It demands a response from us. And the other thing is, is that you and I, we all have a beginning with God. So I wonder, what is your beginning? If you wonder, how do I talk to my friends about the Lord? Talk about your beginning with God. Where did it begin with you? He wants a relationship with you. Where did that begin? And it's in process somewhere, right? He's also a God of boundaries. When we look at creation, the other, the other thing that pops out at me about God is he's a God of boundaries. He set the day and night, sea, sky, land, grass, flowers, trees, every sort of seed-bearing plant and tree. It says sun, moon, stars, <coughs> animals, you and I. He set up all those boundaries, not only for the earth, but also for you and I. Adam and Eve, when you get later down... In the second chapter, so in the first chapter, it's God said, God created, God did. Then when we get to chapter 2, where he creates human life, it's the Lord God. It changes from God to the Lord God. And that means Yahweh. That's a personal God. That's Jesus. Okay? When you see the Bible say, the Lord God, that's referencing Jesus. So Jesus also walked with Adam and Eve and breathed life into Adam and breathed life into this place and set a boundary for them. They can have any food from anywhere in the whole garden except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That was the only boundary, right? And we know it had apples on it. And apples really aren't that great. I'm not exactly sure why you had to take a bite of it, but you did. <laughs> all in all, they could eat anywhere they wanted, and they broke the boundary. There was a boundary. Now, I just want to confess something to you. I want you to know that sometimes I think the church um, does a lot of boundary talks with youth groups. We talk a lot about things you shouldn't do, and, and, and I'm not going to get into purity here, but boy, do we just pound purity into your brains. Like, that's the only boundary in this whole book. You know what I mean? It, it, it bothered me as a youth group member, and sometimes I think our church does a great job of standing here before you telling you boundaries, and pastors do a horrible job in big church telling adults boundaries. Boundaries weren't meant for youth group. Boundaries were meant for humans. For all of us. I just want you to hear that from me as I'm speaking about boundaries. I'm speaking to myself and I'm speaking to you. We all have got boundaries. Okay? But let's just take a look for a second at just creation. When creation breaks the boundaries that it's given, what happens? How many of you have been to Haiti? <coughs> yes? Yeah, most of us have been to Haiti. You saw what happened when creation broke its boundary. Right? With the earthquake, what happened? When the earth shook and it broke its boundary, disaster and destruction. New Orleans, flood, right? Um, I grew up every other summer. We went up to the Jersey Shore as a family. We'd go to Atlantic City, um, we'd go to the ocean. It was some of the best memories of my life. And man, when that east coast was hit with that flood and that Ferris wheel that my sister and my cousins, we went on over and over and over again was floating down the ocean. It was like my memories were going adrift. It was destruction, complete destruction. The earth didn't keep its boundaries. It broke its boundaries, and there was destruction. Adam and Eve, Adam and Eve, they broke the boundaries. They took a bite. They ate from the tree they were not supposed to eat in. They broke the boundary that God had set for them. You and me, man, I sin every day. I'm sure I'm not alone in that. I break boundaries every day that God has set for me.
me, what is best for me. He put boundaries in place for us to live in harmony with each other, with the world, so that we could show him. And we break those boundaries. And I'm going to get, I know you're talking about the fall next week, so you guys are going to be like kind of a little bit more educated. You're welcome. Um, Thank you, Kristen. Um, Okay, so they broke the boundary. And it said, it says in verse 25, the man and his wife were both naked, but they felt no shame. They were created, and they were in the middle of the garden, and they felt no shame. They felt great, right? And then seven verses later, seven verses later, it says, And they felt shame. It took seven verses for them to go from never feeling shame to making a break of a boundary and to feeling shame. That's how fast it is for you and me. Seven verses, man. That's it. And they suddenly felt shame and said, and they went and they hid from God. When we break boundaries, how often do we hide from God? I hide from God all the time. I think I'm so smart, and I'm not. But what's so beautiful is Jesus came and said the Lord God came and he walked among the garden. And the first thing he said was, where are you? Where are you? He didn't need to ask that question. He's God. I mean, come on. He put the stars in the sky. He knows where they are. He could have been. And maybe this is your picture of God, and I'm just here to tell you that you're wrong. He could have gone, hey, saw what you did there? Now you're hiding from me, I see. Not feeling so good, are you? Some of you might have that picture of God, but that isn't, who, that isn't what he did. It said the Lord God came and goes, where are you? What happened? What did you do? He was reaching for them to reach back to him and say, I'm ro- okay, I'm over here. I messed up. Broke your boundary. Right? When Haiti happened, you could just hear the Lord go, where are you, church? Come. I need you. We broke boundaries. I need the church to come do healing. He came for Adam and Eve, and the same question goes for you. When you think you're hiding from God, he is coming and walking among you, and he's going, where are you? Come back to me. It's okay, I'm here. He's a God of boundaries, and they're set for our good because he is better. What boundaries are you not keeping today? We're all not keeping some kind of boundaries. Are you willing today to repent from those and to turn back to him? Because he's whispering, where are you? He wants you to answer him back. The next thing, as I was preparing this and reading over the creation story, um, he's the God of the unexplainable. I love. And um, so in Genesis 1, 11, so, you know, he created, went through and he created. And then it says that he created every sort of seed-bearing plant. And it said that it produced all kinds of trees and trees. The land produced vegetation, all sorts of seed-bearing plants and trees with fruit, and their seeds produced plants and trees of the same kind, and God saw that it was good. Now, um, my father-in-law, Dave's dad, has a nursery and garden center. He's a nurseryman, a horticulturist. So they were here last weekend, so I checked with a professional to make sure I was correct because I wanted to make sure. But a plant or a tree needs two things in order for it to grow, right? It needs water and it needs sun. <coughs> But the one thing that hadn't been created yet didn't come till the next day. The next day it said, let the lights appear in the sky. Back up. Okay, we see that it bloomed. It produced seed-bearing plants and fruit before the sun. He's the God of the unexplainable. There are things that he does, and you think it might be out of order, but in some ways he needed those trees to get going right because he needed oxygen for us, right? Because he knew we were coming later. So he's, he's an orderly God, right? He knew we were coming, so he needed some oxygen to get going. But, but he didn't have a son yet. When you live in God's storyline, when we have a lens of God's plan for all people and all of life, he's the God of the unexplainable. And that's the moment when I started going, I am itty, 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 bitty. <laughs> you are very, very, very big. Because you can do things that make no sense. And I cannot. I can only do things that are explainable. I can only explain things that I do, right? That's all I can do. I can really only explain step by step how things go. And that's where he becomes God and I become not God. And the Romans 4.17 says that when we live in his storyline, God calls into existence things that do not exist. He brings life 
from the death and he calls into existence things that do not already exist. And when we choose to live and walk in God's storyline, there will be things about the way we walk that do not make sense and the things that we cannot explain. And he will call you to things that only make sense in the context of his storyline. Trust me in this. I'm a bit b before you, ahead of you, in this walk with the Lord. And he will call you to things that do not make sense. And people are going to question you. The world will challenge you. Just like the serpent said to Eve, did God really say that? Is that really what he said? Are you sure? Are you sure that's what he really said? Are you sure that's the boundary that he said? Are you sure it's not that? It's, it's this tree? Or is it? And then God's power gets questioned. And then we kind of get a little bit shaken up a little bit, right? You guys have probably all been questioned, my friends, I am sure. Then we try to explain an unexplainable God. We try to explain him. We try to go, well... Okay, okay, as long as we're not having sex, then we're keeping the boundary, right? But let's just make out. Let's just do that. Because at least at least we're keeping part of the boundary, right? We kind of explain it away. If you're having to explain something, at least I'm I know it's an old test from last year. I mean I'm not really looking at somebody else's paper, but I mean it's just an old test. It can be that bad, it can be really cheating and I mean, I told my parents we were watching a movie, and that's why I'm late for my curfew, and really, we were not there, because it would just make my mom nervous. It would just make, I did that. That's an example of my own life. Um, uh, I would always say, oh, we just started this movie. It was such a lie. I was a liar. Okay. But, <laughs> moving on, what I was doing was I was pushing my parents' boundaries, right? They gave me a boundary. I had a curfew at midnight. And I was pushing the boundaries of my curfew in order to get what I wanted. And if you have to explain things away, then you are not in the middle of God's storyline. So stop it. And I'm speaking to myself. Stop explaining things away. Because when you position your feet in the very beginning of the story, in the beginning, God. That's it. You position at the very beginning. You declare him God who reigns over your life alone. And because he reigns over you, you long for his best, which means you long for his boundaries, and then you owe no explanation to anybody. Now, I'm not saying your parents, but I won't get into that. That's not part of the creation story. They can talk about that later. But I want you to hear that. He is the God of the unexplainable, and he will ask you to do things. I had to this last year. I had to do something that didn't make sense from a human standpoint. I made a decision based on God's certain call on my life. And I lost friends over it. And it was a lonely season for me. But I've never felt God carry me more in my whole life than in that moment because I was in his storyline. For the first time, join his storyline. It's better. Okay, so we talked about if this is all true, all this is true, what does that mean about God? So we talked a little bit about what it means about him. So now what does it mean about you? What is creation? How does that transform you? So in Genesis 1, 26, it said, Then God said, Let us, notice the plurality. I already mentioned that Jesus was walking. Let us, this is also knowledge of the Trinity, that we know that the Trinity existed in the creation story. We know there was God, we know there was Jesus, and the Holy Spirit was there as well. Let us make human beings in our image to be like us. I wonder, how many images do you think you see in a day? I'm just saying, I, I only look at Facebook and um, Instagram, and I Snapchat, but I'm, I know for sure I don't Snapchat like y'all do. <laughs> I'm just positive. Um, but how many images do you think you see in a day? Just think through. Like a hundred? Oh man, guys, come on. More? Oh yeah. Yeah? Way more than that? Okay, so how many images do you portray in a day, do you think? Okay, how many of you have taken a selfie and then retaken it? Because you didn't like the way it looked. Thank you. Honesty time. I appreciate you. Honesty time. I have. Thank you. I mean, what is this? I'm You're the right. only honest guy in this whole room right here. No. More power to you. Yeah. Okay, so how many of you think through, think through the amount of images that you portray in a day? How many images do you portray in a day? Now, studies will say, so boys, you can kind of shut down a little bit. Studies will say that women look into, in the mirror eight times or more a day. And half of those women carry a portable mirror, portable mirror with them. Now, I'm sure that we all, if you're drivers, you look in the rear of your mirror before you get out of your car. I mean, this is just a normal...
normal thing that we do, right? It's a habit. We look to see, like, what we, how we're looking. We all feel pressure to keep an image. Raise your hand if you feel any pressure at all to keep an image of whatever that means. I'm the smart girl. I'll always get A's. I'm the smart guy. I'm the best athlete. I am. I'm the strongest guy. I'm the number one. I want to be picked all the time. We feel pressure to keep an image. And I will tell you, when I was your age, I was a master at keeping an image of being a Christian girl. Oh, my goodness. I had it down to a T. I knew what I was supposed to say. I knew what I was supposed to look like. I knew decisions I was kind of supposed to make and not supposed to make. I was a master at it. On the outside, I had the best image going on. And on the inside, I had no transformation. None. Jesus wasn't reigning in my life. I was keeping an image all the time. I want to tell you, we are not image keepers. That is not what the Word says. You know, the word keep means cause to continue in a specified condition or position. To keep means it's got to stay in the same place all the time. And when you live in God's storyline and when you live with the God of creation, it's transformation. We are not called to be the same person year after year after year after year. We are meant to be transformed by the power of Him over and over and over again. When we try to keep our image, we can't offer anything that we keep. If I'm keeping it up here, I can't offer it to you. I'm keeping it. It's mm -hmm. mine. I can't give it to you. It's all selfish. It's all about myself. There's no life in that, and there's no fruit in that. The Word of God says that we are an image bearer. We bear an image of Him. Do you know that the moon has no light on its own? The moon has no light on its own. It only looks good when it reflects back the fullness of the sun. We only can see the moon when the sun is behind it, right? And, okay, we have no light of our own, just like the moon. John 1.1, 1, 1. John also does the creation story. It says, in the beginning the word, that means Jesus as well, in the beginning the word already existed. So we know Jesus already existed in the beginning. The Word was with God. Jesus was with God. And the Word was God. Jesus is God. Now we know that. He existed in the beginning with God, and God created everything through Him, and nothing was created except through Him. The Word gave life to everything that was created, and His life brought light to everyone. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. Jesus is the one that gives us light and life to be an image bearer. To bear means to carry, to bring, to transport, and to move. Are you carrying Jesus' image? Are you carrying it anywhere? Are you transporting it? Are you moving it anywhere? Are you bringing Jesus' image anywhere into your life, into your family, into your friends, into the world around you? John the Baptist did. He comes in right next. John the Baptist, cousin of Jesus. God sent a man, John the Baptist, to tell about the light, Jesus, so that everyone might believe because of his testimony. John himself was not the light. We are not the light. We are not God. John himself was not the light. He was simply a witness to tell about the light. The one who is the true light, who gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He came into the very world he created. But the world didn't recognize him. And he came to his own people, and even they rejected him. But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They are reborn, not with a physical birth resulting from a human passion or a plan, but a birth that comes from God. So the Word, Jesus, became human and made his home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness, and we have seen his glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. Jesus walked with Adam and Eve, and he walked in the earth when they sinned, and he said, Where are you? And then when it all went awry, Jesus came back. And he walked back on this earth, and he said, Where are you? He came back for us. He came to walk with us again, to be with us again. He came to redeem us. One of my favorite doctrines is redemption. Because you cannot redeem something that you didn't already have possession of. 
You see, Jesus didn't come and just buy a bunch of things. He came and redeemed people he already had possession of. We are already his children. We were created in his image. And we went awry, and we hid. We broke boundaries, and we hid from him. And he came back, and he said, I want you back. Where are you? Come back to me. That's not how I created you. You are to bear his image. When people look at you, the light of Jesus should be what comes back from behind you. I know you all can picture people in your head who just, oh man, bear Jesus. You, you want to be around them. They're just such fun to be around. They're encouraging. They're loving. They're tender. They want to be near the things that God cares about. They're on the fringes. And you know those moments in your life when you have been the image bearer. When you know that you have met people on the fringes where Jesus is to bear his image. Because that's the last part, right? If this is so true, what does that mean about God? What does that mean about you? And now what does that mean about the world? What he's saying, I love, you're the God of the city. It's so perfect. He, we are meant to come into this broken world and to offer them the where are you? I want to tell you about my beginning with God and how he came and said, where are you? And I reached my hand out and I went back to him because he came to rescue me, to redeem me, to walk again with me, to bring me life so that I may bear fruit and I might live in his storyline and I don't have to explain it to you. Just hang out with me and you'll figure it out. We'll figure it out together. That's what he did. If you have Jesus in your heart, in your life, if he is reigning over your life, and there's a difference of, dear Jesus, please come into my heart. And I'm not making fun of the prayer, but I'm kind of making fun of the prayer. <laughs> because I say, I say it every time. Do you guys ever in church feel like, if you are feeling the Lord call, then pray this prayer with me. And I'm always like, well, just better make sure, checks and balances. You know, like, better make sure, check the first time. You know, you're so open. But no, that isn't more than that. It's more than that. He reigns over my life. He's in charge of my life. I've given over the striving because I'm not an image keeper. I'm not keeping up an image anymore. It's exhausting. When you have to keep something, you've got to keep it going over and over and over and over again. And that isn't the life God called you to. He called you to bear his image to the world. And that means that you don't have to keep it up. Keep going. Keep that smile on your face. That isn't the life of God, you guys. It's okay when you're not doing well. <laughs> it's okay when things are hard because they will be. But we serve a God that calls things into existence, that which doesn't exist. <clears throat> and if you're in a time in your life where you need Him, reach out to Him and say, I'm calling on you. I'm calling you to call into existence something that doesn't right now. How are you being a witness? This God of creation, this God who set things into order and into motion perfectly, without error, and he was intrinsically involved with all of it, seeping through it. How are you bearing that light? And do you know him that way? Read the creation story if you don't. Ask him to reveal himself to you so that his light might shine brighter and brighter and brighter because you bear his image. Thank you so much for letting me talk with you guys today. Have a great week.